Well, up to this point in time, we've talked quite a bit about the different formulations of um, amplitude variation with offset or with angle theta, incidence angle theta. And we've had uh, different relationships that we've talked about. We've talked about the Aki Richards uh, relationship, the Bortfeld approximation, the uh, Shuey approximation. These are all approximations of amplitude variation with offset that are that is defined in a more complicated set of equations by Zopritz. And um, so we have equations like this where we have uh, a change in the P wave acoustic impedance and uh, over twice the average, the change in the uh, shear wave acoustic impedance and and so on. We're, we're familiar with this kind of a formulation from our previous uh, discussions and then we get down into this representation here where we have the uh, compression wave acoustic uh, reflectivity, the uh, shear wave reflectivity, and the density reflectivity. We also have this additional term here, k sat, k hat sat, or k bar sat, uh, which is the ratio of the average shear wave to P wave velocity squared in a saturated, um, saturated water saturated medium. And um, <clears throat> so at this point, what we're interested in, in doing is we have an anomaly like this, a uh, class 3 anomaly. We can measure from the uh, gathers. We can measure the amplitude variation with offset. So we have, you know, we see that these coefficients in here are a function of offset. We also have to have information about the velocities. So we do need uh, some um, uh, preliminary information in order to um, set up an equation like this. But what we're interested in at this point is being able to determine what the, you know, in this particular example here, what the compression wave reflectivity, shear wave, and density reflectivity terms are. And so that's, that's what we're going to be talking about in the next couple videos. And uh, also as, as a uh, you know, some additional background and perspective and just kind of a framework to make sure we're all on the same same page in a sense uh, is, and I think you know, we've been assuming that most of you have kind of a basic uh, a reflection seismology background, so the idea of the common midpoint gather is, um, you know, everybody understands what that is and basically with the common midpoint gather we've got, um, you know, in this depiction here we've got sources on one side, uh, receivers on, or you know, sources on one side, receivers on another, and uh, they share a common midpoint. And that's about the only thing we know in the absence of knowing something about the subsurface geology. We know that we that, that this arrangement of uh, sources and receivers does share a common midpoint. Whether it shares a common uh, reflection point, that's a different thing. It's a different matter, different issue. As you know, if the layer is dipping, we tend to see as we go from short um, source to receiver offsets that the reflection points walk up, dip up the dip of the reflector. So in your gather, we'll be seeing variations in amplitude that are going to be associated with changes in the physical properties of the interval that we're reflecting off of. So these could be stratigraphic variations or changes in the uh, uh, properties of the fracture network and so on uh, that are not associated with a single point on the surface but are, are spread out across an area and thus are not uniquely associated with the physical properties at any one point along the surface. Now if we're dealing with a common reflection point at least we're getting closer to looking at the variations of uh, properties uh, associated with reflections from a common depth point or a common reflection point. We might want to think of this as a common reflection point. And the properties that were uh, that are controlling the uh, amplitude of the reflections from a common reflection point then would be if the compression wave velocity, the shear wave velocity, and density, for example, associated with the materials at this point. And of course, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration too, because we don't really see points 
uh, in seismic data, what we do is we see Fresnel zone scale areas, reflections that uh, the information comes back from an area, not a point, and also from a thickness of an interval which is about half the tuning thickness. So we're looking at uh, what we might refer to as the properties of, we're getting information about the properties of a Fresnel zone scale volume rather than a point. And um, so even within this volume we can expect to see some influence from property variations and the bulk uh, properties of the Fresnel zone scale volume might be about the size of the building that you're sitting in. I'm not sure how big of a building you're in. but So we're, al we're also um, need to you know obviously kind of make this distinction between offset and theta, <clears throat> and when we collect data in the field, and uh, even after processing, we have um, amplitude variations as a function of offset. And so we see an increasing um, amplitude as we go from near offsets to far offsets. And this um, amplitude, referring to it as R sub PP, um, is a function of travel time and also offset distance x. Now, Russell notes in his paper that sine of theta, for example, um, can be represented as x times the interval velocity over the two-way travel time times the RMS velocity squared. This comes from Walden's 1991 paper. This would be a good paper to uh, reference, you know, as you go, you know, as you, as you explore these ideas, so that the offsets in the gather can be converted to um, angles and over here we'd much we've been talking all along about uh, variations of the amplitude in this case for the compression wave uh, as a function of uh, incidence angle and not offset distance so we're interested in the amplitude variations as a function of two-way travel time and this incidence angle here also, I'd note, you know, just, just again, uh, make sure that we're all kind of on the same page that we typically have been referring to this acronym here, AVO, Amplitude Variation with Offset. And uh, we're really talking about, we have been talking about amplitude variations with uh, angle. Because all these relationships that we've been looking at, angle is our, um, uh, our independent variable. So... Uh, so we need to to make sure that we're we're uh, we understand that we're talking about theta and not offset in that case. And uh, an additional point to focus on, and this is uh, these are a couple gathers that come from uh, Walden's 1991 paper. And you can see here, there's a, these are two different gathers. We have uh, you know just pointing at this event over here, got a positive reflection code. We got positive amplitudes over here. We have two cycles. And uh, so these are these are two different gathers, approximately in the same region. But down here we have the uh, amplitudes plotted as a function of sine squared theta, and uh, and you can see that we do not really get straight lines when we fit the data. Uh, these are, these don't really look like they would be straight lines. We're fitting straight lines, uh, true enough. But uh, um, Walden uh, recommends, you know, based on what you see over here that you use a more robust estimate for the regression line using um, uh, regression by mediums combined with a maximum likelihood estimation approach. So that with a more ro robust approach, we're kind of, um, the, these longer offsets here have a disproportionate weight on the regression line that's uh, fit using a least squares approach. And, and Walden also notes that the sine squared transformation makes the uh, you know, brings the near offset traces closer together and the far offsets um, consequently space further apart but they exert a greater influence on the fit. You can see that here between the least squares estimation and the uh, more robust estimate here. So that's something else that has to be taken into consideration in going through this uh, uh, analysis procedure setting up for uh, inversion to get the these parameters. Uh, up to this point, we've been talking about the 
RPP of theta and time uh, terms. Those are measured from the data. And these coefficients here, we've calculated those. Those are a function of uh, your compression wave velocities, your average shear wave velocity, compression wave velocity, uh, theta. And you can see where noisy data is going to complicate and make these estimates of these parameters over here um, subject to a certain amount of error. <clears throat> and uh, so what we really want to do, we're looking at this as a matrix equation. We have the matrix uh, or a column vector here associated with the um, um, amplitude variations as a function of incidence angle and, and time. And then over here we have a column vector which has the parameters. These could be parameters like the acoustic impedance um, for the compression waves, the shear waves, or the density impedance. And then these would be those co coefficients that we've talked about on numerous occasions for the various kinds of relationships that we've been looking at. So uh, this would be the matrix equation that we need to invert. What we want to do is to come up with the, these terms and we'll do that through a process of matrix in, inversion. So next time around we will uh, talk about how we're going to get R sub A, B, and C in a general way and then we'll need to have some additional, an additional video or two to talk about uh, matrix inversion and then we'll be talking about uh, the inversion of reflectivity to get uh, impedances. So um, uh, we'll continue on with this in our uh, next video. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us, and s see you next time.